Is John the Baptist the secret to tying the Old Testament to the New Testament? That's what we'll find out in Matthew 3. We start out with John the Baptist in chapter 3. We skipped like 30 years. Matthew wants to get to the talking part. He loves the talking part. So in our past chapters, we find out Jesus is born. And we'll find out in other books that John the Baptist's parents were both in the priestly class, were much older cousins of Mary. They knew each other quite well. His name in Hebrew means God has been gracious. And in his name itself, you can see Ye. It starts out Ye, which means Yahweh. That's the Jewish name for God. And when you see Ye right in front of something or at the end, that means God. God is in there. And so we find him as an adult preacher in the wilderness near the Jordan River, probably not too terribly far from the Sea of Galilee. The Jordan River runs from the Sea of Galilee all the way to the Dead Sea, which is so salty that you can't do much in it, but you can float in it, which is pretty exciting. He was telling people to repent. This is the first word of his ministry, and it'll be the first word of Jesus's ministry too. This is a prescription for everybody. I talked about in the introduction how some things were descriptions and some things were prescriptions. This is a prescription. And is it just for the people who are sitting there? Nope. It's a prescription for everyone. We should all repent, which means turn back, turn around. It's not just saying, I'm sorry. It is changing behavior, changing direction. And he also says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that phrase somehow in our time period feels like the end. If someone says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, we think, oh my gosh, this person is saying the end of the world is happening here. But that may not necessarily be true. The kingdom of heaven, sometimes called the kingdom of God, but Matthew doesn't say God because we don't say God in the Jewish religion, means that it's a time when God will reign in our hearts and on earth. There's also this reference then to Daniel 2, 44, and it says, in those days, God of heaven will set up kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor the kingdom will be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So I guess if you're a guy like Herod and you think your kingdom is meant to be forever, although he's dead at this point, this may be feel like the end for you because this is going to bring on eventually a single kingdom ruled by God that never ends. So he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3, saying that he is the voice calling in the desert. You have to make the path straight, which is a concept when you had kings. I heard about this in England, too, that when the king was coming to visit your area, you would make the way straight. You'd take all the rocks out. You would take all the bad curves out. You would make sure the road was nice and flat because a king is about to visit, and so you want to make everything perfect. If you prepare the way and make the road straight, it makes it much safer for the king. He's also this concept of the holy man in the wild. He's dressed in camel hair and belts, and if you've ever been near camels, they're pretty smelly, rough, kind of unclean animals. It says he ate locusts. Some people said those were beans, but most people feel they were bugs and honey. And the honey was there to sweeten up whatever it was he was eating to make it more palatable. Because either way, it probably didn't taste very good. However, what you're seeing here is that he's not going shopping at the local Galilee Quick Trip. He is eating whatever's available. He is eating out of the wild and living in the wilderness. One of the points that it brings to is that in 2 Kings 1.8, describes Elijah in almost the same way. And in Malachi 4, 5, which if we remember, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their father, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. But in studying this chapter, I found out something really interesting, this concept that John is where the Old Testament ends, not Malachi. John is the last of the Old Testament prophets, and he is introducing Jesus coming. 
So he's saying, I'm coming to an end. My testament is coming to an end. And here comes the New Testament. Here comes the real king, the real prophet, the real Lord. And so this is where the two testaments meet each other. And I thought that was really intriguing. I never thought about that because it's true. John the Baptist does strike you as one of the Old Testament prophets. And when you're raised Jewish too, one of the interesting thing is they expected in our temple with my relatives that Elijah would come back. There's always a seat left on Sabbath meals, on Passover meals. It was sat like another person was coming and this was spot was for Elijah, hoping that if we make a spot for him, we'll know immediately when he comes back. Some people felt that Elijah was going to be the Messiah or Elijah was going to tell of the Messiah coming. And so John the Baptist being this image of Elijah, who everyone expected to come back or usher in the real Messiah, hmm, that's kind of interesting. And so they say that people were coming from all over Jerusalem, Judea, other countries that were coming to get baptized, confess their sins. And while ceremonial washing was part of the Jewish tradition, you'll see a lot of traditional baths that were ancient in Israel, if you take tours and archaeological digs, it was a big thing. But this baptizing was a little bit different. This seemed to be something stronger or even newer. So when John's doing this and people are confessing their sins and he's baptizing them, he sees Pharisees and Sadducees there coming to his baptism. Calls them a brood of vipers. And, you know, of course, snakes are dangerous. They slither around. They hide under rocks, but they can kill you. So it's also a callback, maybe, to the Garden of Eden where we see a viper there as well. But the Pharisees were more like scribes and poorer men. And they were interested in doing what the scripture said literally. And they came into rules rules around rules, because they didn't want you to accidentally break any of it. They also believed in the whole Old Testament, which they didn't call the Old Testament. It was just the Testament. I don't even know if they called it a Testament, but they believed the whole thing. Everything from the first five books of the Torah, along with all the prophets, and they tried to do everything correctly. The Sadducees were their enemies. These were aristocrats. They were Hellenistic. They melded into the Roman Empire quite nicely and made deals with the Romans to keep their power in place. So they only believed in the first five books of the Torah. They weren't interested in the prophets at all. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in many things that the Pharisees believed in. And they were much more loose about things while they hated each other. They both wanted to go after John the Baptist because they probably heard rumors. Israel was a very small nation at this point. And when a lot of people start going out into the wilderness and getting baptized by this guy, people take notice. So were they there to be baptized or were they there to reclaim their people and show John to be this fake Elijah person? You know, we don't we don't know. But all we know is that John immediately turns his warnings of repentance and talks about bearing fruit. And I assume he means you're not bearing fruit. You're not bearing good fruit. And so if you're not bearing good fruit, you're not a good tree. You're not following along in God's plan. And then even warns them further, don't just rest on your laurels of your heritage, on your being able to call yourself back all the way to Jacob, your Jewish background, your Israeli background. Don't rest on that Because he says that if God wanted to, he could get a bunch of rocks and turn them into the children of Abraham. You could be replaced with rocks. And then comes the next part, that the axe is at the root, which is not a pruning. You know, you can fix a bad tree by pruning it and making it a little bit better. The time for pruning is over with. The axe is at the root. The tree is coming down. And then he talks about the tree. It does not bear good fruit. Again, talking about the fruit. And so it's going to get cut down and thrown into the fire. He says that he's baptizing people for with water for repentance. But the one who's coming after him is mightier. And he's going to baptize people in the Holy Spirit and fire. 
And I think that's this idea that Pentecost is coming. Then the last bit of prophecy comes in saying that the winnowing is about to happen, which means that's where you're going to take wheat and you're going to separate the good part from the bad part. And you throw the bad part in the fire and you keep the good parts. He even calls it the unquenchable fire. So this is a pretty stern warning. And he's saying this to scribes, leaders, and this is going to be the core of Jerusalem. So Jesus comes in and wants John to baptize him. And John's like, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me because you're the one we've been waiting for. And Jesus says, nope, baptize me immediately. Do it now. And as soon as he did, a dove landed on him and a voice from heaven said, behold, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. Jesus hasn't even done his ministry yet and he's already pleased God. So we end there with the baptism of Jesus. He has now ended the Old Testament, taken on the reign of the New Testament, and with the baptism, checking every box of prophecy, he is now ready to take on the mantle, the mission he was about to do. So let's continue now with our analysis. This took place somewhere around 27 to 28 AD. More details are given in the Gospel of Luke. This takes place at the River Jordan, somewhere south of Galilee, but north of the Dead Sea, probably closer to Galilee, which means it's on the still northern part of the country. On the far eastern side, we see in this chapter Jesus, John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, whole group here, and the crowd of sinners, which included people from inside of Israel, outside of Israel, Pharisees. Sadducees who agree about nothing, but they could agree, we don't like this John the Baptist guy. And in other books, it hints that the apostles, some of the apostles, were in that group too, which explains why so many people, when they saw Jesus, they immediately followed him. When it comes to the literary tools, people feel that, again, John the Baptist is that comparison to Elijah. He is the one who is making the way for the Messiah that was predicted that there is no 400-year gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is the last chapter of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. This is the new covenant coming. We get a lot of imagery when it comes to this. We, talk, we see the brood of vipers. We talk about the tree and whether it has fruit and the axe being at the root of the tree. And then we also talk about the separation of the wheat, the good from the bad and the fad being thrown into the fire. And then the next major imagery and concepts we see are baptism. Again, a cleansing. We have baptism today. It's a little bit different than what John was doing, but baptism in removing the sin from our soul, not just cleaning our bodies from dirt. And then we see the dove. We will see the dove more, particularly at Pentecost, but that is a sign of the Holy Spirit. They are gentle, peaceful. They they don't defend themselves in any physical way. And that's the image of the Holy Spirit. When it comes to rest on Jesus, that is a sign the Holy Spirit is with him. This chapter tells us that the message God wants us to hear is of repentance. Turn back because the kingdom of heaven is near. And these are messages for us to also repent so that we can be the tree that bears good fruit instead of the tree that bears bad fruit. And we also know that God was pleased with Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry. What does this say about human nature? Well, first of all, we see a lot of people going to John the Baptist. They want to be cleaned of their sins, regardless of what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were cooking up. The common man wanted to be clean of their sins. People don't like sin. They do it. We all do it. But it's not what we want. It's not our natural state. We long for a place where we don't see injustice, where we don't see sin, where we don't see ourselves sinning. We want that. And if people would travel from other countries to get baptized by John the Baptist, they were seeking to know what it is that would cleanse them from the things they do from God. So it's really a powerful image. I read in one of the books in history that said John the Baptist followers 
existed over 200 years after John the Baptist was killed. So his impact is in history, he's written about, but he also had followers that were strong in what they believed in John the Baptist was saying. And it was so strong that it grabbed the powerful, the scribes, the aristocrats, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees from probably Jerusalem to go check out what was happening. And the central message of this chapter obviously is repent, accept baptism, accept the Holy Spirit in our lives. There's no need for us to have this physical distance from God. There's no need for the sin to separate all of us. And we know now that hearing the word of God, being baptized, And confessing our sins is how we can repent and do what God asked us to do, which is what each of us needs because this is a prescription to everyone. And I think the last message for us from this chapter is that we should never rest on any type of concept of who we are. I'm really smart. I went to this school, or I'm very rich and I have all the money in the world I need, or my lineage goes all the way back to Paul. Whatever you say you rely on, you have to understand God could take rocks and make a bunch of whatever it is you are. We're special because we're God's children who he loves. And he sent his son to us so that we could have eternal life. My meditation for this is wondering who I would be in the crowd. I always like to think of that when I read the Bible. Would I be the stuck up Sadducees who are aristocrats, Jesus is below me, or the Pharisee, hey, I'm trying to do God's will, but I have it all wrong. Or would I be one of the people coming to see John the Baptist asking for forgiveness? But whoever I would be, I have to know, I have to repent, I have to confess my sins, and I have to remember that God loves me because of me being his child, not because of anything I have anything I do, or any heritage I come from. My prayer is for the world who looks at the message of Jesus and thinks they're better than this, that they don't need Jesus, that they don't need repentance. How many people would show up today to listen to the words of John the Baptist? And then what I want to share is to let people know that God loves them. He sent his son, and he asks us to repent, confess our sins, and rely on him. I hope people see the message of the Old Testament and the New Testament coming together and the new covenant starting. And covenant, by the way, means agreement with God. Also, any scripture I read is coming from the translation of ESV. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and end Matthew 3 right here. Thank you again for listening. And you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. If you have anything to say, you'll find in the show notes links to the website, which is still under construction. So if, again, you find an episode's not there, this should get resolved, hopefully this week, and you'll find it come back if you don't have it. And again, if there's anything I can do that will make this Bible study better, if there's any recommendations that you have, please just let me know. I'm happy to hear whatever you have to say, good, bad, or ugly. Thank you very much for listening.